this is Frederick Stallard for the Efficiency Engineers podcast. Today we are here with uh, Mark Costello, who is the CEO of Hub Insurance. He's a, he's a family man. He's a really interesting person. We met recently in uh, Cologne during InsurTech Symposium, um, an incredibly valuable event for making connections. Uh, and that's when I got the idea to invite Mark to this podcast, because I believe he has uh, really strong ideas and I want to uh, share those ideas. So Mark, thank you very much for being here today. How are you today? Yeah, I'm really good, Frederick. You? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. This is exciting because for me, um, podcast recording is completely new. I uh, love listening to podcasts, but if you suddenly have to do it yourself, it's uh, it's quite uh, it's exciting. It's a game, right? Exactly, exactly. So I hope we'll get through this without any technical uh, technical worries, but I feel we got off to a, to a good start. Cool. Let's do that. Nice. So, uh, Mark, I'd like to start with this, um, with this question. What kind of person is Mark Costello? Like, how would your friends or your family describe you? Oh, um, okay. That's, uh, that's deep and meaningful to get kicked off, right? Um, so I think I am I'm pretty straight talking, probably too straight talking. Um, uh, I, um, I think I'm quite a forgiving person and um, I'm a very, very optimistic person. And I've also got a real strong streak of what's right and wrong. I come from a, a long line of uh, family members who are all very left-wing. I'm maybe not quite so left wing as they were, and like my, my, my grandfather was, but I still have that sense of what's right and wrong, and and that drives a lot of my decision making. How is it driving your decision making? Could you elaborate a bit? I don't like greed, um, I, and I don't like uh, like if you just look at the world that we live in at the moment, right? I, I don't know what it's like in Belgium, but in the UK, like the current cost of living crisis is it's it's like for people in my social circle by and large it's pretty much like an abstract concept so they might find it themselves a, a bit out of pocket and but they don't really notice it um but there is people really suffering right and and i find that inconjugable that 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 normal people can just go about their life and almost ignore that fact that i can't ignore that fact i find that very upsetting yeah it's uh it's kind of you 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 make it a it's a personal thing for you right what is happening yeah it's a personal thing yeah um it's a personal thing and i think that the political leadership in the uk is disgusting um i think brexit was a horrific thing to to tell all our nearest neighbors that we don't want to play with them anymore right if you take it back to that basic thing of you know it's like being the kid in the street that that just can't get on with other kids that that that's not i don't think that's who we are as a nation but i think that's the impression that we've given people and i think it's really horrible yeah so as a defender of fairness and um attacker of greed you could have gone to politics but instead you're uh, an entrepreneur yeah, I could have. And, and do you know what? It's funnily enough, my wife says that at some point I need to, to stop being an entrepreneur and maybe go and do politics. Um, I think that my problem in politics would be that I'm also Glaswegian, right? So um, the thought of not using expletives to, to tell people what I think of them is almost impossible for me. Yeah. So I don't think it'd last very long in that arena. You're too direct to be diplomatic. Yeah, oh, I'm definitely not a diplomat. Yeah, I like that though. I like uh, I like direct people. Um, I feel, uh, especially in Belgium, not not enough people are are direct, or people are not direct enough, and you don't always know then what's going on. It it's uh, it takes a lot of energy then, you know. Yes, so obviously I don't really understand Belgian culture, but I I certainly think because I've lived in England for most of my adult life and then moved back to Scotland a year and a half ago. English people are much more, uh, Scottish people just tell it as it is, especially in Glaswegians, which is my hometown. They just tell it how it is, right? Um, and people are, and it's funny because I say this, like, obviously I've been away from Scotland a long time, but still coming back regular. But coming back and living here, I realise how utterly rude people are, but they're nice. Whereas I think uh, 
when I'm down south, people are pleasant but not nice. Uh, and that's not everybody. It's a sweeping generalisation, but that's kind of the equilibrium that I try to explain to people about what the difference is. Um, and, and I think that that... Um, yeah, you know what you stand in Glasgow, right? If you speak to if you if, if you're out of order in the public place, somebody's going to tell you pretty quickly. Yeah, is this also reflected in uh, professional life? It is for me, right? Um, I mean, so I've I've worked in the insurance industry my whole life, and um, Steve Brindley, who's um a shareholder in Hub and and as part of the team, um, I said to him about a year into the project, I said. I don't think I would be very good at going back to being an employee. And he said, and he used to be my boss. He said, Mark, you were never a good employee. <laughs> he says, because you just could not respect authority. And and I do this, I respect people as individuals, but that kind of military style system of organization you get in big corporates, I just couldn't deal with that. I just tell people, regardless of who they were, what thought, um, or good, bad, or indifferent. That's just the way I've always been. Sometimes they say that um, like startup founders or entrepreneurs are unhirable. Yeah. Well, I think I'm definitely unhirable now, right? So is that is that also why you um, decided to become an entrepreneur? Or at least your perspective from that, like um, working with authority and systems, is this why you, became, uh, you decided to become an entrepreneur? Yeah, I think so. Um, I also think that... Uh, when I look at what the insurance industries became, and, and look, you know, full disclosure, I only know one industry, right? So whether this is the case across the piece, I don't know. But it's just became bullshit. And you're just like, really, is this what we're becoming, right? Are we just trying to extract every penny out of the customer's pocket and not even trying to become more efficient so that we can pass the savings back to them and really relying on the fact that people buy insurance through inertia and they really just don't like the whole thing. Is that the industry that we want to be? Because when I started, maybe it's youth and I didn't see it, or maybe it has changed, and I'm pretty sure it's the latter. I'm pretty sure the industry's changed for the worse. Um, that's just not sustainable, right? You can't just keep taking money off of people. And 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 when I say that, I mean the broken market, right? So, I, you know, insurance companies sell products, and the the they carry the risk. The brokers don't carry the risk, and I've seen commissions go from ten, twelve, fifteen percent to forty-five and above percent commission. And you go, well, what's that based on? You know, as we became more efficient at in theory. Why is the why is the share that the broker takes from facilitating the transaction between the two parties going up and up? That makes no sense. Um, and 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 that sense of I I I think I can do it better than everybody, right? Uh, well, you've got to have that if you're going to be an entrepreneur, right? I don't think I can do much in life better than other people, but I think I can do this better. And and that that's that's what drove me to to start Hub. And it seems to be working, right? I um yeah I I I know at Hub like probably two and you'll be able to uh, to say it better but two of the most relevant values are um, efficiency and uh, transparency to the end customer. I even read that uh, at Hub you want to have full transparency in costs and profits so that everyone knows what's going on. Is that yeah. Absolutely, and, and we don't have a back office, right? So we're not 100% there with the tech yet, but we are weeks and weeks away from that where the customer gets to see all of the correspondence from us to us, uh, from us and to us about them. They get to see what we earn. They get to see which insurers we've approached on their behalf, their responses. All of the calls that they make to and from us are transcribed so that they're on a system. And it's all report. It's all in the repository for the customer to see at all times, because I just think that in an industry and customers don't trust brokers, right? That that is time after time survey have shown us they don't trust them. So we can't ask them to trust us. Go, oh, trust us. We're great. That's not going to work. We need to show them exactly what we're doing. What do your customers say about it? How how do they? What's their reaction? 
So if you look at our growth numbers, um, we are inside the top 100 brokers in the UK by volume of premium. We only started trading 16 months ago. Um, people in the industry just can't believe that we've got that grown that quickly. And we've got plans to grow it much quicker. Um, it's the proof's in the pudding, right? That the customers love us um, or they wouldn't be joining us and renewing with us and they're all renewing with us as well. Yeah, that's that's really exciting. Congratulations. Yeah, it is really exciting. But the, the, the really exciting bit for me actually is not what we've achieved today. Is the new the new features that tech can deliver for the customer? We think we can do a lot for our customers using tech, a lot, and we can almost get to the point where um, the the actual insurance product that they buy is only part of the journey because we think we can actually help customers um, alleviate claims, stop claims happening, and really give them a better grip in the risks that are inherent in their business. Technology is a is a driver of change and is probably uh, the biggest opportunity for the insurance industry to um, drive towards more fairness, towards more um, a, a better way of serving, uh, better service quality as well. Um, yet, if you look at the industry, the adoption is uh, maybe a bit slower than, for example, financial industries, financial services. Yeah, so, so I've got a Starling bank account, right? I can see everything I do when I do it. I get updated. There's there's really good security features. There is budget and tools in there and all that stuff, right? A typical insurance broker in, 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 is selling somebody a product, right? And that's it. It's just, here's your product. Thanks for your time. We'll get a big chunk of commission. We won't tell you what that commission is, and we might just stick a couple of fees on top of that just because we can. Really, that's like just doesn't even seem, I think if you see it quick enough, it just sounds utterly absurd. Yeah. Do you see the, the pace of change taking up Do you in, in the future as you, for example, so you say, I'm, I, I, I'm really against greed. I'm all for fairness. I will do it myself. You start the business. It's going well. It's an indicator that change is needed and adoption is there. But do you, do you see this effect like rippling through the industry eventually, or do you think there was there will always be like traditional and then some challenger? Okay, yeah. So, so if, if you, that's interesting. Um, we I don't think Hubble wipe out Marsh McClellan, right? A multi multi billion dollar business. Um, and and there's certain spaces that I don't think we can go right. So if you go to like Marsh's global risk team, which are putting together programs for businesses with locations in 50 different countries and all sorts of exposures. That's not what Hub does, right? That is brilliant. That is excellent. That is what, what risk services look like. We think we can give the customer a distilled version of that risk service by using tech. Um, but when you look at the disruption in the market and you look at insure tech, so let's just talk about that as a global thing. Um, there is different types of insure tech. Um, Trying to explain that to some VCs is quite funny, really. But um, what you have is you've got tech vendors who build brilliant tech and sell that into the market. And then what you have is distribution. Or uh, I, I mean, I, I won't laugh when I say that you get people saying they're going to become a full stack insurer. But anybody that knows anything about insurance knows that anybody in the fintech insure tech world who says they're a full stack, stack insurer doesn't understand what a full stack insurer actually means, right? So they're not full stack insurers um so i think there's some amazing tech companies out there we bought one right we bought a company called dfp because the tech is incredible and it really expedited us and brought us ulrich zent dan keely yaya um jake amazing amazing tech guys who had been working building amazing tech to sell to the incumbent traditional market the problem is the incumbent traditional market either don't want to buy the technology for whatever the reasons, or they can't make it improbable with the tech they've already got. Um, so I do think change will come, but I do think that, that I'm, I'm probably not right about this in the future, but at the moment, I think the only way that you push really great tech 
into the customer's benefit is by building your own ecosystems of clients. I think going to the traditional markets with great tech and pushing it to them, that that's a struggle. That's an interesting take, actually, because if you if you look at InsurTech, you probably have two go-to-market strategies. Either um, you're a full-on challenger and build out your own customer base, or you serve who is already there and try to change them from within for the better, transform uh, towards more efficiency, more transparency, better customer service quality. Uh, but you're saying that, yeah, one option is, is definitely um, preferred over the other. Well, one one is also leading to the other, of course. If if large players are not challenged by by new players, then they're not as inclined to um, catch up on technology adoption. Yeah, no, they're not, right? They just aren't. I mean, just some anecdotal evidence that I can give you of how much the incumbents are looking to change. I mean, insurers and brokers. Um, we had an insurer wouldn't accept October in terms of business agreement because it wasn't um, in wet ink and it was signed using DocuSign. And this was during the pandemic, right? So Ed, my co-founder, lives just outside of London. I'm in, was I still in Manchester at that time? No, I had moved to Scotland at, by that point. I'm in Scotland. John, the other co-founders in Scotland, but we live 40 miles apart. So I had to sign it in white ink, post it to John. John signed it, posted it to Ed. Ed signed it, sent it back to AXA by mail because they wouldn't accept DocuSign. Now, this is my point about tech. Tech only works if you've got an agile thesis in your business already. There's no point in buying great tech. And like it was like, I'm the worst driver in the world, right? I'm terrible. No point in buying me a Ferrari, right? Because I'm just going to crash it in day one. <laughs> There's no point in buying tech unless as an organization you're saying, we are going to become more agile and efficient. Mm -hmm. And this brings me to um, what I also observe speaking to different parties in the industry that the uh, common denominator of these success stories is mindset. It's not necessarily technical capability, but it's it's mindset. So you, uh, in my experience, you have two kinds of, of uh, people in the industry. You have the ones that say, oh, this is how we've always done things. And we know it works well because look, look at our business. Business is going well. So we keep doing this. If there are bottlenecks, we'll add more stuff and make sure that we're well equipped to do it. Then you have the other kind of people with the mindset that, that you have, that I have, that say, okay, I mean, it doesn't make any sense to send over this letter physically with a physical post, have a handwritten signature and so on. There should be a better way to do it. And then actually creating that change, like being the start of that change and being committed to maybe swimming against the, against the stream, going against the grain. Um, what do you what do you take what do you think makes up that difference? Like why why is this difference so so prevalent? Yeah, you, you have to understand the organisations that 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 you're talking about that traditional mindset being in, right? These are humongous organisations, humongous companies, and basically the CEO, the guy at the top of those organisations, and and by the way, there, there's some amazing CEOs in the insurance industry. Right? Amanda Blanc is like a, a force of nature, absolutely incredible human being. But you also have, and it's the layers of management, right? So to get to the top of the layer where you're the person that's making decision-making in tech, right, it's probably taking you till you're 50. Or, and age isn't really important, right? But you've got to the point where you're making really great money, you've got a great pension, you've got a great lifestyle. And some guys coming along like like you, who's got some amazing tech to sell to them, and they go, if I buy that and it does drive the efficiencies, which I can even see that it does, what what does that do for me? I, and and that's just a fact, right? And I, I understand that. I don't, I don't think it's... um. And I don't even know that that's a conscious thing, right? I just think that people go, "Am I going to rock the boat? Am I am I really going to rock the boat and try and and try and be the one that strives for change? Because if I do that, 
and it goes wrong, then then it's on me. If I just keep doing what the previous guy done and try and make things slightly more efficient, then I'm probably going to survive longer than if I try and rock the boat. Yeah, yeah. Risk of hearseness. Yeah. Um, why do you, I, I know you mentioned that you've only known insurance, but why do you think this is different in other industries that maybe... Well, I, I don't know that it is. I, th I think that's my point. Um, well, you you could you could argue, for example, e-commerce or banking and finance. They yeah, are probably yeah. five to ten, ten years ahead of of insurance. I mean, e-commerce is definitely different, right? That that is um, that that has moved at incredible pace. But I think and and has banking. So so this is what I'm not sure of, right? Um, so. This is me sticking a finger in there and saying, am I right, am I wrong, I'm not sure. I think there's more money in banking than there is in insurance, right? So I think what they can do is they can create the veneer of efficiency and then there's probably just loads of people scrambling about in the background doing tons of stuff, right? And it's not properly actually automated or, or, or it's not using AI the way that people think it is. Um, so that maybe is the case. But e-commerce, like, the way that Amazon and, and eBay, um, the way that they push products to you now is really brilliant, right? Uh, it's brilliant for them. And it's probably good for you as a consumer unless you're addicted to shopping, then it's maybe not so good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that makes sense, actually. Um, nevertheless, I think, so e-commerce, I, I would probably think the main driver is closeness to the customer. Like the customer is demanding change. Uh, but I, I'm not sure if this is the same with uh, banking, for example. Imagine, like, f how how many times, how how frequently would you use your banking app, and for for what different sorts of services? Like for me, this is a daily basis, and this could be buying train tickets or buying whatever. I can't imagine like daily use of my insurance app today. But maybe maybe there will be a day. Yeah, that's the difference, right? Yeah, I use my banking app daily almost daily right for one reason or another for it's buying stuff or whatever just checking my balance or you know you now go out for drinks with your friends and you're not all pulling cash out somebody pays the bill and then you transfer the cash to them at the end and like the, the app that uber built that the facility that uber built where you and i can jump in an uber and split the bill i mean that's customer service right that is thinking at exactly what the customer wants um I, 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 it's more difficult to do that in insurance because, as you say, people buy insurance on the hope that they don't ever have to use it, right? So, but in my space, which is commercial insurance, unlikely for a lot of classes of business that you buy insurance and don't use it regularly, right? But, but what you find and what's prevalent in our industry, and I know it because I've lived it, is that people make claims... The whole process is elongated. and But it's not the elongation of the process that I think causes the customer uh, frustration. It's that they don't know what's going on, right? So, if, And this is part of our tech build net, is actually showing the customer the journey, the bits behind the scene that make the claim hang together. That's the bit that we've got right, uh, or we're getting right. Because... It's, if you can go into the app and it says, well, we're just waiting for the, the surveyor to give us the report into the claim, and he done it three days ago, and it's expected in six days or whatever, at least you know what's going on. But brokers spend so much of their time fielding these calls just because they're not showing the person what's going on. Yes, it's the it's the uncertainty that stings, right? I it reminds me of something uh, some uh, an ex-colleague, a friend, taught me once, like, we we were meeting for dinner, whatever. He was late, but you know what he did when uh, when um, driving to my place, he just shared his live location on WhatsApp, so that I could like he was he was already late, but I knew exactly where he was, and this took this took completely away the pain of the lateness because I I didn't mind. I was at home and I I knew exactly what to expect. And when the uncertainty is gone, it's not such like a big deal. Right? Problem is gone exactly. Yes. Yes, that that that's that hundred percent. And and like, you know, one of the so so 
So a lot of brokers might say, well, you know, oh, well, we can't afford to have somebody phoning every single time there's an update about a claim. Well, don't, right? Build automation that triages those emails into a receptacle that the customer can see and then they can they can understand. And then if they don't understand what they see there, they can pick up the phone. But nine out of ten times, they live the claim. You didn't. They're going to understand it and they won't need to pick up the phone. But you take away that uncertainty. Yes. So you are um, you are what I would call an efficiency engineer. When you see something that is broken, you have a desire to fix it. Like you can't just sit down as long as you're involved, right? Yeah. Is this also reflected in your uh, personal life, like outside of outside of work? Yeah. I, I, well, I think I've uh, I played chess at really good level when I was young. I still play chess all the time. Um, I give up being an entrepreneur just to be as good again as I was at 18 at chess because I love it so much. Um, but I've always been a problem solver. And then again, going back to that um, that socialist streak that I've got in me, I, I can I think I can see problems and think I can think of ways of resolving it. And the, the one thing I hate in life is apathy. I just can't be doing with people that are apathetic. And, and I think that I see... It, I see problems as good things because I like having a go at fixing problems. Although I'm terrible at DIY, like I am awful. You can't be good at everything, right? It's good to know <laughs> your. Uh, it's 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 good to know your strengths and your weaknesses apart. Uh, and I don't know the. I think the we can uh, leave the stereotypical thing of men should be good at DIY behind us. I'm also not really good at it. Oh, I'm terrible. Yeah, I'm. I like actually, I, I'm. Uh, I tried to hang a, 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 a mirror above a fireplace just at Christmas, and there's still a big, huge hole in the wall where the meal was supposed to go. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Luckily, um, luckily we have uh, our, our significant others sometimes who, who nudge us to yeah, just, get things sorted. Otherwise, yeah, 100%, there's, yeah. there's, there's a hole permanently, and there's no, no mirror to be found. Yeah. Nice. We are getting close to the to the wrap up of this. Um, another question that I really love to ask is, what is something that most people don't know about Mark Costello? Oh, I mean, like now, I suppose that shifts through time, right? But like, um, you know, the kids, the younger people that work with me probably don't know that I'm a huge fan of house music. Always have been, always will be. Um, big part of my life, right? Um, that, I love that it. that's something that jumps out. Uh, uh, I still love collecting records and 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 I love it. Um, that that and I can't really think of much else. Um, you mentioned to me the first time we met that you uh, went out to Belgium to go partying when you were younger. Yes, I did go to Belgium to go partying. Yes, I did. Yes, yes, yes. That's um, the heydays of, of Belgian uh, club scene where yes. everyone in Europe was, was heading down to Little yeah, Belgium. Yeah, the mid-90s, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah before yeah, my time, good. obviously. It was good times. It was good oh, that's times. really cool. I'm, I'm, also, uh, I'm also very much into electronic music, house and techno. So uh, I love to talk about it. And actually, uh, I'd love to maybe also create a podcast on that topic. Maybe uh, maybe we can jump in a second conversation because I think you sounds, can teach me a lot about like a old school house. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sounds like a plan. Thank you so much for being here, Mark. It was a, an absolute pleasure to have you. Um, I hope we speak many more times because I, uh, cool. and I like what you do. Bus- and hopefully we'll work together on the business capacity as well, right? Because the software you guys are developing is so, so perfect for us. Nice. Wish you good luck with uh, everything you do at Help, everything you um, have the ambition for in your private life, and uh, speak to you later. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Take care.